it's great, great to see you all today. Uh, like Nigel said, we're going to record this session um, and there will be lots of opportunities for us to share during our moments of pause. Uh, and as Nigel said, when he is going to edit those moments out uh, so that our, our interchange and our, our exchange is not going to live forever on the internet, that will be edited out. So I am Deanna Bruce, advocate for thriving students and I'm a consultant to the DC Office of the State Superintendent for Education, and I'm super excited that you all took the time today to be here. This is our fifth and final training of the five part series, uh, our LGBTQ plus back to basics and beyond training series where we're focusing on learning how we can and why we must support our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and questioning students. I'm hopeful that you all will have lots of questions and that there be some interaction. There are several points during the next hour where I'm going to pause and push some questions out to you. I also want you to push questions back to me and there are several ways that you can participate. You can send some questions into the chat anytime as the training is going on. You can also take yourself off mute and share in the dialogue during those moments of pause. You can also always just write down some notes for yourself or think about the questions to yourself. So there are multiple ways to participate uh, as we continue over the next hour. So a little bit about me, uh, I have my own consulting business and I've worked at the intersection of health and education for the past 25 or so years. I support schools and get hired by schools and local youth serving organizations and national uh, youth serving organizations to advise, coach, and train school staff on school based health care services. For the past three years, I've spent much of my time helping the DC public charter school board and all of the charter schools on their COVID mitigation strategies and their immunization compliance plans. And for about 10 years, I served as the director of health and wellness for the DC public schools, where I led the team and where we developed and implemented all of the LGBTQ plus supports that are in place. So, as we get going, we have some group agreements. Those of you who've participated in previous sessions know them already. I'm going to run through them real quick. Uh, you all could be somewhere else after school, but instead you're right here. So, let's maximize the time that we have together and be present. Uh, put our phones away and things like that and not pay attention to the other windows that are open on your screen. Let's provide some grace and space to yourself and others. Today's session is on inclusive curriculum and allyships. We're really thinking about what you can do as an educator. So, you know, you're, we're going to push and pull and and so give yourself some space and some grace. Uh, practice active listening, really engage in the content that we're, that we're discussing today so that you're taking in all that you can. Ensure full confidentiality. If you hear something that somebody says, let's just keep it here in the room. And like I said, we're going to edit uh, our conversations out to, of the final document, the final video that will be available on Aussie's website. And then ask, because that's how we all learn. So if you've got a question, drop it in to the chat uh, right now as we're as we're going going along. There's going to be a session evaluation, just like with the other sessions. At the end of today, we're going to have a session evaluation and I'm going to provide a QR code at the end and we're going to drop a link in the chat. We want to give you a certificate of completion for each and every session that you attend. And there are two ways to get that. Well, there's you must complete two steps in order to get the certificate of completion. One is attend the session, which you're doing right now. And two, complete that the session evaluation at the end. So, moving into what we're going to learn today, we're going to. By the end of today's session, I really want you to be able to explain the impact of inclusive curricular and other inclusive extracurricular activities. Oops. I want you to be able to select DC learning standards that you can use to advance LGBTQ plus experiences in your curriculum or in your space. 
I want you to be able to prepare to help students create and sustain gay straight alliances or gender and sexuality alliances, also known as GSA student clubs. And finally, I want you to be able to develop strategies to increase inclusivity in your classroom, in your office, and at your school. So how we're gonna get there. We're going to talk about the impact of inclusivity. We're going to talk about the learning standards I mentioned. We're going to talk about GSAs and other types of extracurricular activities that you can host on campus. We're going to talk about some specific inclusion strategies. I'm going to thank you and give you an opportunity uh, to share some more, and then we'll do a session evaluation. So as we get started, I'm going to push out these questions to you, and I want you to think about the time, a time, maybe the first time, that you saw one or more of your identities reflected back to you in the curriculum growing up. And so think like, was it uh, someone, uh, you know, in, in history that sort of we were talking about, you learned about that reflected your identity back at you? Was it a special guest that your teacher brought in? Was it something else and how did it make you feel? So you can drop your comments into the chat or you can take yourself off mute. When did you see your one of your identities reflected back to you growing up in school? So I can unmute and hop in on here. Good afternoon to folks. Um, so I would say, honestly, I've only seen one of my identities in the curriculum that um, I guess I was exposed to, if that's the words we want to use growing up. And that was just by the sheer fact that I was a Black person, right? But there also was still few and far in between. There were not many women um, that were highlighted in any of the pieces and then not even getting into all the other identities that I carry, they're not able to be visibly seen by I, right? So thinking about sexuality and all those things, but I did not see those things being represented in any of the educational, you know, pieces that I received in elementary, middle, or high school. Right, so that's also an answer. No, I didn't see that. <laughs> How about anyone else? Anyone else see something or not see something? I'll talk about something recently that happened recently, as in probably about six years ago. Uh, one of my kids came home, uh, they were taking AP US history and they came home and wanted to have a conversation with me about Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers Movement in California. And so it was an opportunity for us to talk about Mexican American identity that we all sh that we shared and, uh, and, and what it took to do the organizing uh, that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta uh, undertook at that time. And so that was, it was a little, it was kind of exciting for me to even uh, understand that the teacher was using uh, Mexican American culture and history uh, as, as she was teaching the strategies in AP US history. Anyone else? See any of your identities reflected back to you? Your silence is, is not uncommon. I've been in many rooms with teachers and educators where we talk about how your identities, how did you know that you were valued growing up in school uh, based on your identities and a lot of people are missing it. And you see that play out today where a lot of schools, certainly school districts and charter schools are trying uh, to recruit teachers at the very least, let's recruit some teachers that reflect uh, what the students look like as well, uh, to try to create some, you know, bridge some of that gap where the students are not actually seeing themselves reflected. And when you don't see yourself reflected in the curriculum, it's just harder to engage. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, that why uh, that, I, that I just sort of alluded to. And so what we know, is that, and we've talked about this over, I think in every single session, we've talked about 
the fact that LGBTQ youth are more likely to be targets of bullying and harassment, um, the, the, and which can lead to symptoms of anxiety and depression. Young people that are LGBTQ plus can exhibit suicidal, more suicidal behaviors uh, as compared to their peers, their, their cisgender peers or their straight peers. We know that uh, approaching 50% of our young people that identify as LGBTQ plus are considering attempting, have considered attempting suicide in the past year. So these are some, some seriously hard numbers and data and stories that you all hear at school and that we all know from looking at the data. But what we also know is the is on the on the flip side that you all have the power to change that affirming en environments can greatly reduce uh, risks of suicide and other mental health symptoms. We know that affirming environments that can really go a long way to helping young people who identify as LGBTQ plus or any young person who feels like they are on the margins can help them feel more included. And that doesn't just have to happen at school. It can happen at home, in after school programs, on a sports team, in the library, a rec center, at church. There are just so many places where we have an opportunity to get in front of a young person and affirm them. And this is more data. We've, I think I've shown this slide to you every single session, if not almost every single session, because it shows me and I hope it shows you that you can make a difference. You really can. You already do make a difference. Accepting adults can significantly reduce the risks of suicide in LGBTQ plus students. And so how do you do that? Um, well, there are very specific things that you can do, but it also uh, what I'm asking you to do is show up as an ally. And so I want to talk a little bit about the role of allyship right now. And I have, there's the link at the bottom that you'll get when you get the slide deck soon. And this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And the Southern Poverty Law Center has a whole series of curriculum resources called Learning for Justice. You may have heard of Teaching Tolerance. They've rebranded themselves as Learning for Justice. And I mean, if you're willing, cancel your weekend plans and just do a deep dive. They have so many resources for you as educators and school staff members for increasing inclusivity across you know, sexual orientation and gender identity, which we're talking about in this training series, but we know that student, we need to include students across race and socioeconomic status and, and all sorts of ways. And so there are resources uh, in Learning for Justice uh, about that. But when it comes to allyship, this is across LGBTQ, the LGBTQ space, but an ally is a partner in empowerment, right? You become a partner for that young person in empowerment and you speak out against injustice, you support marginalized groups and individuals on their own terms. So you, that, you already know this and I'm just giving you some good definition. You, you can see, does, do, do you resonate with this? Does this resonate with you? Are you this? Could you be this? Uh, and, it, it, and being an ally means that you're recognizing oppression broadly and you're standing in solidarity with people that experience oppression. And this, this is important, this last part is whether or not you belong to the targeted group. So you can be a transgender teacher and still be an ally to your transgender students, to your lesbian students. You can be a, a straight cisgender person and still be an ally to your gay students and your transgender students. So you, you can belong to the targeted group, but you don't have to belong to the targeted group. You can still be an ally who stands up uh, to oppression. Allyship, requires commitment. And this is something that we all know from working with schools is that it, you've got to build young people's trust and you've got to build the trust of their families. And one thing that breaks trust so quickly is for you to pop in and out and not be consistent and not be there and not show up. And so allyship requires a level of commitment. It requires that you are accepting that responsibility to be unwavering in your support uh, and unwavering uh, in, in how you focus on how power and privilege function in a school environment and beyond. 
Now that's a big, that's a, that's a big definition um, that I think all of you are probably already serving as. There are a lot of you in this call. I can tell I've already looked at some of the evaluation data. I can tell that some of you are already serving as allies or are, are you know, in a position where you could step into an allyship role in your school. And so I think about like setting the tone for your students. How do you signal to them that you're an ally? Well, you can post pictures of allyship on your door or within your classroom space. You can, you know, there's, we talk, we've talked about like rainbow stickers in your classroom, but there are other forms of allyship. You know, when you're talking about um, Bayard Rustin and the March on Washington, and he organized it, and he was a black gay man and didn't get a lot of recognition for that. And, you know, that, that he had to hide that part about him uh, in order to be able to stay, you know, in the, you know, and be able to play the reindeer games and, and lead the March on Washington. Uh, you know, you can communicate that you are a safe space for your students. You, you've got clear expectations. You're setting those at the beginning of the school year. You're modeling how you want students to engage with you and engage with other. And you can, and that, that is how you can you know, go a, pretty far in communicating that, you know, that you are a safe space for them. We also talked about like a rainbow lanyard or something. And today on, on, uh, on Facebook, I saw uh, one of my DCPS teacher colleagues post a picture where she was about to step into where she was going to train uh, some of her peers on LGBTQ issues. And she was ra wearing a rainbow lanyard. And I, I chuckled because like, oh my gosh, I just gave that as an example earlier in this training series. And there she was sort of showing this being that ally communicating that she's a safe space for her students. You can communicate that you will not tolerate harassment around key groups, around protected uh, traits. Uh, and that's important for your students to hear you say that to other students that you don't tolerate it. And, uh, and I think about that same teacher who I saw on Facebook and I know she's, she's really good at this last 1 of saying, not in my classroom. You know, that goes a long way. Nope. I don't know what you're doing outside of my classroom. I don't agree with it, but I'm telling you that's not going to fly here. Uh, and that really goes a long way around setting expectations for behavior and how you want people to be more inclusive. And what I know about harassment is that it doesn't just go away by itself. You can't like wish it away. Uh, and so it's important for you as an educator to model for your students exactly how you want them to treat each other. And I want you to, 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 to interrupt harassment when you see it happening through your through words like that doesn't happen here or what did you mean by that so gay that's used as as derogatory what did you mean by that or you know if you have to do an office referral or something like that but that you are interrupting the harassment when you see it and what we know about silence uh, you know back in the when we were doing a lot of the HIV advocacy, there were t-shirts that says silence equals death. And that is, uh, that was sort of a, a, a symbol of what was happening at that time where people weren't speaking up and elected officials and people in positions of power with access to resources weren't speaking up. And what we know, we can extend that here to supporting our LGBTQ plus students. We know that silence teaches everyone that that behavior can continue and it's okay. Um, and that targets, people who are targeted for harassment and discrimination will not be protected because our silence is teaching them that they're not going to be protected. And so if they need to look for a trusted ally, a trusted adult, they can't find one among the people who are silent. And this I know, you know, from, you know, from education, from parenting, from just about everything is that students pay attention to what we do more than what we say they and you know every teacher knows that you know when you're standing up there at the front of the classroom those students are scanning you looking for signs of weakness looking for signs of strength looking for uh, affirmation looking for all those things so they really are watching you they're watching all of us and they're looking for um modeling of the behavior that we want to see 
And so let's talk a little bit now about how do we shut down derogatory language? That's a big question that I get when I train schools is like, what do I say? And so the human rights campaign, and there's that link there at the bottom that you'll have when you get these slides that talks through some strategies on how to shut down uh, derogatory language and what the human rights campaign recommends is to keep it simple with a quick response that clarifies your position and your expectations. So you're keeping it simple. It's a quick response. And the goal is to clarify your position and expectation. And there's a long list of them on their website. And what I would recommend is that you pick a couple and then you practice it in front of the mirror. Uh, this is, these are the strategies that I've done myself. Just practice what you're gonna say in advance uh, in front of a mirror so that in the moment you're better prepared to, to do it. So remember, we don't use put downs in this class. Using the term homo to tease someone is harassment and it's unacceptable. Um, you may not have meant to be hurtful when you use the word gay to mean something is bad or stupid, but it is hurtful. Do you know why it's hurtful? Right? And some of these, like it depends on the age group, it depends on how frequently the, the harassment, the discrimination, the bullying is happening. But these are, you know, you can scale up and down based on how often it happens, on the developmental age of the students. But these are just some examples for how you can just quickly try to shut down something. And then you know if things escalate, you know how to de-escalate, and you also know what to do when there needs to be a consequence, like an officer's role or something like that. So I'm gonna pause here and ask you to drop into the chat or take yourself off mute and give me an example of what you could say if a student is speaking derogatorily to another student. How could you model and demonstrate inclusivity? So tell me what you could say or should describe how you could model and demonstrate inclusivity. And feel free to just take yourself off mute or drop it in the chat. It's not appropriate to say, that is not appropriate to say. That's one thing that you could say. What else can we say to exemplify respect to such and such and then let them answer? And there's something about that, that what else can we say to exemplify respect? You're, 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 you're showing uh, that uh, you believe that they know that to be, you know, you know the answer to that. So you're rising up to a higher level with them, which is a great way to get young people out of sort of the negative thing. Like, but I know that you're, you're, you're such a kind person. I wonder if you could use, say that again, but in a way that's, that's more kind. So you're, you're speaking up to a value of, uh, of a higher level than the way they're behaving or, or expressing themselves. Another, I'll share some way that I try to model inclusivity is um, I try very hard not to name call and uh, because calling people names is very shaming and it sets people apart and it's not very inclusive. So I try not to call someone um, lazy. I try not to call them a bully. I try not to call them like labels because labels can feel very permanent. There's like, they're not a, it's not a, not a, a behavior that you did, but it's like who you are and you're bad. Uh, and so that's one thing I try to describe the behavior. I didn't like the words you used with that student. I think that you can, you're a very nice person. And I wonder if you could rephrase that 
uh, in a way that's more supportive. So I'm saying, I'm not saying stop being a bully, but I'm saying, can you please use, you know, I don't like the words you're using. So I'm describing the behavior that I don't like because behavior you can change and that's not fixed and that's not necessarily shaming. Okay, let's keep going. So we're going to talk about the standards. Um, you're going to watch me sort of totally nerd out again. Uh, I do love policy, but I also love the learning standards. I was so fortunate to serve on the national committee that revised the national sex ed standards a few years ago. So I got to work really closely on some standards that also are um, you can see reflected in the DC health education standards way back in the day uh, before I even worked at DCPS. I said I testified before the State Board of Education on the DC health education standards, not the 2016 version that we have today, but I think it was the 20, 2006 or 2007 version. So, you know, put on my best fancy clothes and wrote out testimony and test showed up and testified uh, in support of the standards. So uh, these these are very close to my heart. Got to submit testimony, well, submit uh, feedback on the menstrual health education standards to OSSI uh, last at the end of last year. And that was exciting to be asked to, to, to offer up some feedback. So these standards are designed for specific subjects uh, so like a classroom teacher, a health education teacher could pick up the menstrual health education standards that are new, the DC health education standards that were developed in 2016. And a social studies teacher could pick up the new, brand new social studies education standards that were also adopted this year. But it doesn't mean that they have to only be used by those teachers, and it doesn't only have to be used in the, in the classroom. But it kind of gives you sort of those age ranges, those grade ranges, when certain content and topics and skills development uh, can be used or developmentally appropriate for certain ages. So it's, it's great for any teacher or school professional to use to build out an inclusive curriculum or programming or something like that. Now, Standards are really important. You all know as educators that standards, that learning standards are really important. They guide curriculum development at the local education agency and educator level. So the state education agencies across the country will develop the standards, learning standards, and then it's up to the school district and the, and the educator to develop uh, curriculum and lesson plans that are based on those standards. It, provides developmentally appropriate learning and skills development that I mentioned. It offers uh, specificity for inclusion in curriculum across the grades. So if you uh, need help in trying to figure out where and what, the standards provide some specificity for that. And also, I honestly believe that these standards, the, as inclusive as they are in the District of Columbia, it really demonstrates the government's support for LGBTQ plus inclusion in schools and curriculum at all grade levels. And so there, I'm gonna break down all three of the standards a little bit more. So the menstrual health standards were part of, uh, were required by DC Council, it was passed uh, by law, the requirement in 2022, and then the standards were released earlier this summer. And there are three main requirements of them. First, local education agencies are required to install and maintain dispensers for period products, and they must be in women's bathrooms at schools and in all gender neutral bathrooms at schools. So. If you're not seeing period products in your bathrooms at school, you could ask, hey, I think this is something we're supposed to be doing. Where are they? Aussie is required to develop a sign that includes medically accurate information on the safe use and disposal of menstrual products that can be used and placed in those bathrooms. And then it required Aussie to develop standards, uh, menstrual health standards 
for all students, regardless of gender, beginning in grade four. And I say regardless of gender, we have a lot of students who are transgender or non-binary, and they may experience their period in a way that's different than perhaps what a, what a cisgender student, uh, female student may want and, uh, or, or desire. So a, a, tr a trans masculine student may start having their period and that may be uh, stressful for them. And so it, the standards also are, are gender neutral, but they're also in their gender, not just gender neutral, but also gender inclusive. So that it, it guides teachers in how to have conversations about menstrual health with students of, of you know, regardless of, of gender identity and inclusive of feminine identity uh, and masculine identity students who may also uh, have experience having their periods. So then I want to talk about the DC Health Education Standards. They were, like I said, revised in 2016. They are benchmark. They t they have all kinds of different sections for them. There's health promotion, accessing information, communication, healthy behavior, advocacy. And other, so they're organized in these different sort of skills development categories. And you'll see LGBTQI a sort of inclusion. Uh, at d various grade levels. So first you'll see immediately at elementary school level, there's a conversation around diverse family structures. And then uh, in middle school and in high school, you'll see that LGBTQ plus information and resources are included. So this is a guide for a health educator that you, these are grades by eighth grade, which means basically by the end of middle school and by 12th grade means in high school that you should be uh, you should be including this kind of information in your health curriculum. And then finally, we've got the health education standards and those, like I said, were revised in 2023, 20, which is huge. It's been so long since we had new uh, social studies education standards. And these you'll see in the, at the elementary levels uh, and then also at high school, you'll see specific threads for content for uh, inclusion in curriculum, diverse family structures and communities is happening at kindergarten. The influence of LGBTQ plus community members on DC history is happening at grade, grade one. And then the inclusion of LGBTQ plus oppression during World War II in grade five. And then at the high school level, you're gonna see uh, the advancement of LGBTQ plus experiences in DC history, in US history, and in world history. So there's a lot of opportunity for educators to have conversations and to include uh, LGBTQ plus content in their curriculum. So we're gonna pause right now and think about, have you used any of these three standards to guide your teaching or the work that you do? And if not, how do you see you being able to use them, begin using them in your practice, whether you're a classroom teacher or if your role is outside of the classroom? Have you used any of these standards? And if not, how could you begin to use them? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was at DC Public Schools, the Laramie Project was being performed at the Ford Theater. And um, if you're not familiar with the Laramie Project, it's a play version that's based on interviews that were conducted in Laramie, Wyoming after Matthew Shepard was, was murdered. And he was the young college student who was murdered uh, by two young men who met him in a in a gay bar uh, in Laramie and then um, murdered him at the side of the road. And uh, and so this this was being performed at the at Ford's theater and there was an opportunity for us to have lots of our students come there together. And so I my team and I worked with our health education teachers, our English teachers and our 
um, social studies teachers. Well, I was working with those content leads in the central office and we were pulling standards and trying to figure out where this could fit. And sometimes even while maybe like the DCPS social studies curriculum had paced something into the spring semester, we we're like, well, would, would any teachers be willing to move it into the fall so that we could uh, include this? And so we, we were connecting standards all over the place so that uh, we could recruit a lot of teachers to bring their students to take advantage of these free, the free screening, the free screenings, whatever, free productions of the Laramie Project for them during the school day. And so that's an example of how uh, I collaborated with educators to use the different standards to, to drive instruction. And a quick plug for the Ford, for Ford's theater. They have a teacher program. They are always giving away free tickets to their plays for teachers to bring their students. It's a great opportunity. Anyone else want to share? Well, we'll go ahead and keep going. And we're going to move into chatting about GSAs and extracurricular activities. So gender and sexuality alliances are student run organizations. And I think that's important for you all to remember that clubs are student run. And the reason why I push that is that we have a lot of legal protection for clubs when they are student run. There's less protection for sort of staff led student initiatives. But if these are student run organizations, they appreciate uh, Supreme Court protection that allows them to meet on campus and principals cannot prohibit them from being on campus. School districts cannot prohibit them from being on campus if they are student run. So G gender and sexuality alliances, also known as GSAs, and those of y'all who were in school a while back probably remember gay straight alliances and what young people have told us is that that's not inclusive enough and so they've, they've changed the names uh, the name to gender and sexuality alliances so they're student-run organizations that connect connect lgbtq youth with their allies to help build community and organize at school you tend to see them in middle and high schools and a lot of schools have that as sort of their school districts will set that as a goal to make sure that they help facilitate students starting gsas in their middle and high schools some elementary schools have something similar to a gsa i can think of a few schools in dc that i've worked with that do have some elementary school gsa type clubs but they tend to be more broadly focused on diversity and inclusion together even though they might call themselves the rainbow club or the peace club or something like that they tend to have diversity and inclusion as a fundamental sort of focus GSAs, they're kind of three purposes, and the GSA network uh, has, you know, they do a lot of the organizing and the support for GSAs across the country, and they tell us that there are three reasons why you might want to have a GSA at your school. It provides for socializing and community building for LGBTQ plus students. It allows students uh, an outlet for activism and awareness and promotion of sort of awareness and inclusivity. And it's a place of support and safety. And it may be for some students like the only place where they can feel like they can let their hair down and just be themselves. GSAs, uh, even though they are student initiated and student run, they do require an advisor to support them to help them, you know, year after year. You may be the constant. The students come and go. They're they're gone in just a few years at the middle school level. They're gone in just a few years at the high school level, where you can be that help with that sort of leadership development and sustainability. And so why have a GSA aside from like it provides support, it provides advocacy, it provides community building, but there's a lot of data, the GLSEN, which is a national organization that supports educators on LGBTQ issues. They did an actual GSA study. And so they found that there's just a lot 
of evidence that that shows that the presence of a GSA on campus can really improve the school climate across the board for for LGBTQ plus students and also for other students that just having a GSA can improve the school climate is kind of powerful. GSAs offer a space, right? A space for community for LGBTQ plus students. They they may be the minority in your school, but this can provide them with a with a space for community. The way that we know that affinity groups do in general provide that space for folks. Uh, they the G, Glisten has shown through its data analysis that GS people who belong to GSAs can experience a greater sense of school belonging, which helps as an educator. Uh, it improves self-esteem and it can lower levels of depression. So it can help with all the things that we've been talking about over the five sessions. And there are they what GSA members themselves say are the value of a GSA. They say that that's a place where they can learn about LGBTQ plus issues just because they are bisexual doesn't mean they know about bisexual issues. And so they can come together in a GSA and learn together about sort of cultural identity and stuff because, you know, it's interesting, like, yes, I, I identify as Mexican American and come from a Mexican American culture but it's different for young people who are LGBTQ. They're not necessarily coming from the culture. Their, their, their family of origin is not necessarily the LGBTQ plus culture, the way uh, other of our, our, our identities are extensions of our family. Or we bring them from, we learn them from our family or, and carry them with us. Uh, they, uh, members of GSAs can, can also talk about how GSAs are valuable because it allows them to work with school staff to improve inclusivity. So it gives them a voice to be able to advocate and work directly with school staff. And I've seen GSAs lead a lot of changes that schools have made. And it's really cool to see schools partner with their GSA club to develop and implement those kinds of changes. And it's also a place to share and discuss harassment and dis discrimination that's happening at school. And ideally, the students are lifting up sort of common threads that perhaps then the advisor can help them address with the administration and get stopped. And then a cool thing that I see GSAs do is they'll kind of latch on to some of these sort of national events that are happening. So there are a number of national LGBTQ plus events that happen throughout the year and there are national organizations that have resources for GSAs that are trying to move some of these activities, which is great for young people. Sometimes they like to do their own thing and sometimes it's nice if they can just like use a toolkit and implement something that somebody else has also already sort of planned out and then they can plan it out for their school in a way that matches their school's culture. So October is not only my birthday month, but it also is LGBTQ plus history month, which is super exciting and it's coming up in just a few days. So there's tons of resources and that's I've seen schools and GSAs take on LGBTQ history month in really cool ways where they'll use a bulletin board at school and they'll paper it with uh, LGBTQ figures in history or they'll tell stories uh, about LGBTQ history uh, uh, and, and, they'll, and they'll run programming. Perhaps they'll run a little event during lunch or something where uh, students can participate. It's also a great way for teachers. It's an easy way for teachers to include uh, LGBTQ content into their curriculum because it's their history month. It's Hispanic Heritage Month. It's Black History Month. There's lots of opportunities during these months where you you have an extra amount of attention on something where you can add on. No Name Calling Week is in January. National Day of Reading is in February where you can read an LGBTQ plus book in, in class. Solidarity Week is in November. National Day of Silence is in April. And then there, the GSA network also has youth organizing opportunities. And then I would encourage everybody, if you don't already know about DC Public Schools Leading with Pride Conference, you should get to know it. Adolphe Johnson is on here. You should ask her questions about it. And it's a conference for LGBTQ plus students across the DC region, and it's a whole lot of fun. So we're gonna pause and think about 
have you participated in an LGBTQ plus month um, event at your school? Maybe it's the school, <laughs> uh, Adelphi says, yes, ask all the questions. Uh, maybe it's an LGBTQ plus event at your school, or maybe it's one you ran or participated in when you were in high school or maybe when you were in college. Um, but think about like, have you participated in an LGBTQ plus event at your school? I have not, but for one of our partner schools, they're doing a unity day. And so that's going to be exciting for me because that's one of the LGBTQ events they have going on in October. That's exciting. So you're going to get to partner with them. Exactly. That's fun. Are you going to sing Queen Latifah while you're there? Absolutely not. <laughs> I'm like, I love, I love unity days, but whenever I hear the word unity, I think of Queen Latifah, which is not a bad thing. What would it take? I'm to just a horrible such singer, event? so I don't want to do I, it a disservice, <laughs> even though it's a rap song. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I've been told at karaoke that I can't sing, but I have great stage presence. So I think it was a compliment. I'm taking it. What would it take to support such an event at your school? I'm also saying all this knowing that Nigel's going to edit it out to save me from embarrassment. Although I do have a sweatshirt that does say, ask me about my karaoke song. So clearly I'm an only child and an extrovert. So like, sure, give me that attention. I love it. I help organize. See, if I tell you enough stories about myself, you'll tell me stories about yourself. See, I knew I could, I would, I would bore you to death and then you'd have to tell me what's happening at your school. So you help organize the Brooklyn Middle School Pride Day in June. You're the librarian and coordinate with an open book foundation to bring an LGBTQ author. After the author's reading, we have a pride party at the library. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. What a great way, and also you're you're bringing uh, your expertise as a librarian into the into the day, uh, and and you know I really encourage you all to do that. Like you you don't have to really think so far outside of the box. Like do what you're good at, right? You're the librarian. You're good at that. Do that. Lean into that and share some of that passion and joy that you have for books uh, with students and and incorporate it into the LGBTQ plus planning. All right, let's keep going. We've got some inclusion strategies that I want to share with you that you all know, I'm sure, but uh, we're going to review them with you and hopefully spark some some ways in which you can go back to your your school over the next month and try some of this out. So we talked earlier in the series about Radine Sims Bishop, who's a retired professor from Ohio State University, and she was the one who sort of coined that phrase that children need windows and mirrors. They need mirrors in which to see themselves reflected in the curriculum and their experience, and they need windows to help them see another perspective, to see the world that's beyond their locus. Uh, and then we also know that students can use a, a glass door, a sliding glass door to just sort of like bust out into the open and uh, allow them to step in and experience another world. And so sometimes when you may take them to a museum or to an event outside the school, you're giving them an opportunity to step out into somebody else's experience. And then we've talked about inclusive curriculum over and over in lots of different ways. You can tell it's important to me because I keep talking about it. Uh, but inclusive curriculum, it's giving you an opportunity to really identify gender stereotypes and limits in popular culture. And that's what good educators do. Like it, it is your job. It is something that you're really good at. You teach young people how to be critical thinkers, right? And you teach them how to um, resist things that don't make any sense, right? You're teaching them how to, to, how to think. Uh, and so this, you, you can use an inclusive curriculum to advance those priorities that you already have. 
it teaches students how to be allies, how to support each other, and it teaches, it, it, and it immediately interrupts hostile attitudes where you can sort of really challenge them and like, really, does that really, is that, is that the best way to think about this population or group? And then some strategies that we've discussed before are using words like scholar instead of boys and girls, avoid arbitrary gender segregation for classes and lining up and lunch, social emotional learning, we brought that up before, is a strategy uh, for a, teach, a teaching strategy for inclusion or uh, a strategy outside of the classroom for inclusion, really focusing on those social emotional practices and finding ways that you can even include LGBTQ support and inclusion when you're teaching SEL practices. Those can be some of your examples. And then we've already heard about the library. The library is a great place to explore LGBTQ uh, inclusion and to promote it. Uh, our students are always looking for library resources that reflect back to them what they're experiencing and give them that window of what they need to know and what they want to know. So think about how you could develop strategies in the classroom and at school. How is your role set up to implement inclusive strategies for LGBTQ plus students? So how could you implement some strategies? And or think about your role. You know, we already heard about um, Edgardo was talking to us about being a librarian. So how is your role set up to implement inclusive strategies for LGBTQ plus students? Do I need to start telling you more stories about myself? So you can drop in some things to make me stop talking. I think about a school that I worked with several years ago. I worked with their social worker uh, who was the GSA advisor on campus. And I remember her talking about um, mental health and the Trevor Project as a, as a resource, and that that was one way that she, you know, she really used what she knew about mental health and LGBTQ work to sort of promote some of the education that she helped her GSAs with on campus. Uh, and so we also see counseling groups as another thing. I know some, some, some uh, mental health professionals in our schools will run groups for students. And uh, I'm familiar with, an, one of the alternative schools in town that where the librarian was running groups with students. It was like a reading book, reading group, or kind of like a book club, but it was for the LGBTQ plus students on campus. Um, and it was a way that they could come together. So in closing, explain, we, I wanted you to be able to explain the impact of inclusive curricula and extracurricular experience experiences. I wanted you to be able to select DC learning standards that you could use to advance LGBTQ plus experiences in your curriculum. I wanted you to prepare, help prepare students to create and sustain GSAs on campus. And I wanted you to develop strategies to increase inclusivity in the classroom and at school. And I hope that we got there together over the past hour. And so I, before we close out and I show you that QR code for the uh, evaluation, I wanna ask you some big questions about the whole five session series. And it, you don't have to have attended all, is that even, is that even English? You, did, you, don't, you didn't have to have attended all five of them to be able to answer these questions. But if you attended one, two, three, four, or five, what did you learn today or any time during these five sessions? What questions do you still have? What else do you want to learn? And what other resources do you need to support LGBTQ plus students at your school? Please, you can take yourself off mute and share, or please drop it into the chat. The answers to these questions will help advise Aussie 
on the work that they do next to support LGBTQ students and to support schools in supporting LGBTQ students. So who learned something today or during the five sessions? Hey, it's me again. So, <clears throat> oh, I didn't put my little hand up, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> But one of the things that I did learn that actually was in yesterday's session was in a conversation that was talking about different ways that um, teachers and admin and adults and professionals in the school system or in schools are, all, are able to identify, but then also other ways that we're able to help the students to identify, identify the students that are outside of the binary. And one of the things that I had not heard before that was um, super helpful, and actually I was pretty excited about it, was the... Um, the notion of teacher and TR and like having that in front of the name, like that was something new for me. And so I really appreciated that and really look forward to being able to um, share that with the other folks in DCPS as they're always looking for other ways to um, engage with their staff and students outside of those binary constructs. That's awesome. Yeah, I learned that too. It was very cool. All right. Sadia, would you like to share? Oh, I was just saying I've learned things. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> things. Anything in particular? It's It's been a lot, actually, over the past couple of weeks. So um, from today, I would say about the GSA and how it's more beneficial for it to be a student ran organization versus being something ran by a uh, staff person and um, wondering if that is something that's at any of our partner schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. No, I uh, thanks for sharing that. That's it's something that we it sometimes it gets lost in the sauce, especially because some schools will give extra duty paid to their teachers who become GSA advisors. So it, you feel this like overwhelming responsibility to lead the show, but you really want to let the students lead and you follow and, and support and, you know, do what they need. Somebody says that they learned how important it is to have trusting adults to support LGBTQ students, especially regarding uh, especially in regards to suicide, whether that's supporting them directly or just creating that space for them. Right. I'm glad because I mentioned it every single session and like a broken record. It's so important. You all are so important. You are incredibly valuable to your students when it comes to showing support for them and improving their health outcomes. It's, it's actually incredible how clear the data are in how your support for your LGBTQ students improves their lives. Well, this has been awesome. Um, we can take continue taking questions while you all complete your session evaluation. I can't believe we're already done with the series. It went by so quickly for me, um, but please uh, use your, you can click on the link in the chat or use your phone to pull up the QR code and then, uh, even though I told you to keep your phone hidden away, and then complete that evaluation and you will receive a certificate of completion in your email within a day or two. Uh, and you should have already received set your certificates of completion for all the other sessions. If you did both things, attend and complete the certificate of completion. I'm sorry, answer to complete the session evaluation. And we did have one person who attended and um, did not have time to complete the session evaluation and they were able to just email Taylor and get a copy of that. So if there's a, a session evaluation that you missed and you want it, um, you, you know, just email um, Nigel uh, and he can get it to you. And Nigel's going to drop his email into the chat.
Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to walk you through this process. And don't forget, you've got lots of ways to engage with Aussie. So make sure that you follow them on all the socials and that you've got uh, Taylor's email address written down in case you have any questions or follow up. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you sometime in the future. Or you can always watch my trainings over and over again once they're posted. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye.